Sounds better. All right, Slice, how are we doing tonight? Woo! Woo! Welcome to Temple of Bards live talk show. It's going to be fun night. We got some comedy. We have a special guest. We have Seth Milstein here tonight. We have some commercials. We're going to riff over some commercials. We're just going to generally have a good old time. Is everyone ready to have some fun? Are we ready for some comedy? We're we ready to laugh. Right on. Thank you, Eugene. I recently got back into dating. And when I was asking, what's that? Boo. Boo on dating or boo to me? Yeah, I, absolutely. I agree with you. But I was asking around, especially Oregon, like where is like the worst place to date? Like where do the Ogos go in Oregon? And resoundingly, everyone said Medford. And shockingly, not only did they say Medford, but it was resoundingly that Medford is the worst place in Oregon. And I've kind of heard that all over the place. A few years ago, I lived in Talent, right near Ashland. They didn't like Medford. The Klamath Falls Applebee's had an air of superiority that was completely unearned against Medford. But they told me that Medford sucks. So Medford, by far, is the worst place to live in Oregon. Yeah. Grants Pass, they get a pass. They came in third place because Ashland, definitely number two. Worst place to live in Oregon. And if you haven't noticed, I have listed the entirety of Southern Oregon as the worst place to live in Oregon. I also want to mention that occasion that I am low-key suicidal. And what I often do sometimes is I plan my suicide. And I plan the most gory, horrific, and stupid suicide I can think of. Getting murdered by an Oregonian in Medford was one of the most creative things I can think of. And think about that. It would, and that's the, the more amazing thing about it would be I wouldn't be getting murdered because I would be trans. It's because I was shitting on Medford, which is incredible. So take that, Dave Chappelle. Fuck you. I got murdered on stage for not needing something being trans. But let's face it, if somebody was like willing to murder me because I was talking shit about Medford, they're probably a little transphobic too. Uh, I think the host has convinced me to do something and I'm just gonna try something new because I'm feeling a kind of a weird energy right now and I'm gonna tell you a story and then I'm gonna do something a little weird. It's either gonna go really good or really fucking bad, so here we go. Um, I'm really big into nostalgia. I like going back and watching things from when I was a kid to see how it affects me now. Very recently, I went back and I watched some Andrew Dice Clay. When I was a kid, I remember Andrew Dice Clay, I was not allowed to watch that at all in 1987, but my parents were watching it in the living room. They're like, well, you can't watch this, but I can sure the hell hear it. So I would have my door open and I am listening to Andrew Dice Clay, laughing my little ass off about shit that I don't get, listening to Andrew Dice Clay through a character say the most racist, homophobic, misogynistic bullshit ever. And I'm sitting here trying to watch it very recently. I'm just, just disgusted. It's like, it's really just not funny. Except for the nursery rhymes. I thought those were rather creative. But you know, being a trans woman, it's like, you know, these are really horrific. They're misogynistic. They're homophobic. It's just, you know what? I'm going to reclaim these nursery rhymes for the trans people. I'm taking them back. So, yeah, I'm literally saying I'm about to steal somebody else's fucking jokes. This is why I didn't want to do this, because I think I'm stealing somebody else's shit. But well, we're going to do some nursery rhymes. Say hello to Andrea Dice Clay. How you doing? Hickory dickory dock. God fucked up and gave me a cock. Oh! Fuck me, I shouldn't be laughing so hard at that, but thank you for laughing. <laughs> I'm gonna fuck this next one up, I'm sorry. It's like, this is the first time working these out, so just give me a second. I uh, apologize for breaking it. Jack and Jill went up the hill, each with $3,000. Jill came down with 6 k Jack became Joan, and Jill did everything to make her mom. Oh, oh, oh! 
Little Miss Muffet sat on the tough foot eating her curds away. Along came a spider, sat down beside her and said, Hey, what are your pronouns, bitch? That's all I got for now on notes. We're just gonna reclaim some Andrew Dice Clay because fuck him, it was a character anyway. So thank you for kind of laughing along on that one. I was very worried how that was gonna go. Uh, just one more thing for you. I recently got back from a road trip from a cop festival and it was a lot, a lot of fun. I actually uh, stayed with the host of this show, Temple the Bard, and the first uh, night I was there, I woke up the next morning and went to the bathroom to take a shit and I noticed there was a open bag of Doritos on the back of the toilet. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, it's like they went and ate Doritos at two o'clock in the morning because they didn't want me to see them cramming Doritos in their mouth like some sort of fucking gremlin at two in the morning or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely horrific. But what they actually did, they are such a considerate person that they went in there to eat Doritos as not to wake me up from them crunching so loud. Isn't that like the sweetest thing ever? And I thought, that is so sweet. As I was taking a shit that morning, eating Doritos out of that bag, I'm like, that is so sweet, so considerate. Over the next three days, we both whittled that bag of Doritos down as we were taking shits on that toilet. And I didn't realize until we were coming back that we were both eating Doritos with poo particles all over them. All over them. Now, I don't know how you get pink eye. I don't know how you get diphtheria. But if I get either of those things, I am suing the fuck out of Frito-Lay. <laughs> one last one for you. We played a wiffle ball game at this comedy festival too. And uh, I don't know if anyone here has ever hung out with a lot of like, you know, male comedians and things like that. But that wiffle ball game, while being fun, was an absolute disgrace to masculinity. <laughs> Let me tell you why. When the most finely tuned athlete on the field is torqued up on LSD, you know you got some problems. When there are 20 men on the field and the tranny has to explain to them the baseball rules and how plays work, we have an issue. But it was a good fun. Are we ready to start this show? I think we're ready. Temple is just sitting over here waiting, so we're gonna do that. I'm gonna introduce you to your host. They are hilarious, they are a singer, they are a dancer, they're a musician, they do everything. They're the best karaoke person in Eugene. Give it up for Temple the Bard! Stick around, hit up the couch, yeah. Hit up the couch. Hit up the couch, yeah. You're the sidekick tonight, you down for that? Hell yeah, I am. All right, well I'm Temple the Bard, and uh, you know, usually I do a bunch of silly jokes, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and my history tonight. Uh, uh, I am a non-binary transgender person, and my route here was a pretty interesting way. Uh, I was supposed to be born on the luckiest day in the entirety of the 20th century, which was going to be 7-7-77. Yes, July 7th, 1977 was my due date. I was supposed to enter this world with all of the luck and bring that luck back to my family. But the thing is, even in the womb, I knew that luck could only take you so far in this world. I mean, there's rent to pay, it's not always easy to get food, and you know, by the time nine months came around, I was getting pretty used to those, uh, you know, three umbilical hops on a fetal cot every day, and I wasn't really ready to give that up, so, uh, you know, nine months in a week, nine months in two weeks, nine months in three weeks, during the hottest summer California had ever seen, and my mom didn't have an air conditioner, and she finally just got really, really tired of it, and uh, went down to the courthouse, and a couple days later, the sheriff came by and pinned an eviction notice on one of her maternity dresses. And three days after that, property management came and cut me out with a sawzall. So that's how I entered this world. I wasn't born as much as I was evicted. I was supposed to be born on 7777. I was supposed to be born a cancer, but instead my parents got cancer. Yes, both of my parents had brain cancer. My mom has come through two surgeries swimmingly and she's living independently. And the only thing I worry about her in regards to is how much of Real Housewives of New York she watches. It's, uh, 
She, you know, that that and uh, that show where they're digging up the treasure in Canada, you know, Oak Island. Oh my God, there's like 19 seasons of that. My mom knows everything about Oak Island. And that does worry me about her. As for my dad and his brain cancer, brain cancer only got an assist in regards to killing him. The points went to dementia. But I can see the battle playing out in real time. Dementia versus lung cancer versus brain cancer. With dementia being the one that goes, ooh, me, 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 pick me, pick me. I'll make you forget everybody you ever loved. It's going to be so fun. Fuck them anyway. You never liked them. <laughs> My dad lived his life as a union electrician. And as he started to lose his mind into paranoia, he wasn't worried about, like, assassins coming to kill him. He wasn't worried about wild animals. He was worried about non-union electricians breaking into his truck and stealing his tools. Just, and like, hey, Dad, how's it going? Goddamn non-union fucking electricians breaking into my fucking truck. <laughs> dad, Dad, you've been retired for 15 years. The, uh, union man, you know, once a union man, always a union man. Did you go and check my truck for me? And it got him real quick. It didn't take the dementia long to get him. In fact, the last time I saw him, although it was at a hospital, you know, it wasn't actually in the hospital. Uh, he was sitting in the passenger seat of a 2013 Dodge Journey yelling at me, Hey, I know that you're giving my drugs away to those non-union electricians. <laughs> Union man to the end. So my dad wasn't good at teaching. Like his, his job in our family was to break the generational cycles of abuse. And I'm not gonna go deeply into those because it's not fun, it's not comedy. You know, I don't wanna go there. We'll leave that for somebody with a more sensitive touch than I. But my dad, in the process of breaking those cycles, made a few interesting decisions. Like, I always used to pepper him with questions. I would always ask him these questions like, Dad, why is the sky blue? And Dad, am I ever gonna die? And Dad, why is McDonald's the opposite of Burger King? But he never understood why I, understood why I asked all these questions. And so he put me in front of the TV and the show that was on all the time when I was a little kid was repeats of the 70s series Wonder Woman. Excuse me, I got a cough, sorry. Oh, I'm standing right in front of you, my ass in your face. I didn't realize. The smoke is killing me. Sorry, ass face. Um, so I was watching the 70s Wonder Woman show, which was basically softcore BDSM. Um, every episode, she's wearing 30 denier nylon pantyhose outfits, fetish, hello, and getting tied up or tying up bad guys, flying an invisible airplane around. I wanted an invisible airplane. So all I ever bugged my dad to do was like, hey dad, tie me up, tie me up like Wonder Woman, tie me up like Wonder Woman. And finally, after he got tired of questions like, if a car has wings, would it be an airplane or a car? He would just say, you know, okay, fine, I'm going to tie you up. It'll shut you the fuck up. So that's how my dad became my first ever BDSM partner back in 1980 when I was three years old. And, and as for, like, you know, liking to wear women's clothes, well, my mom had a whole shitload of clothing, so much that it wouldn't just fit in the closet in her room. So she left all of her extra clothes in my closet, hanging right above my toy box. And greedy child I was, I'm like, hey, if it's above my toy box, it's my fucking toy. So I love dressing up like high femme fashion, like all the ladies in the pantyhose commercials. Fetish. And just like living the dream, you know? And But what was really painful about all of that was when it came down to time to go to kindergarten for the first time, I wanted to wear like a really beautiful, like red and yellow blouse with a belt, like a dress, knee highs as thigh highs, some really cute shoes. I wanted to femme it the fuck up. And my parents really didn't have the time, the interest, the capacity, or the language to explain to me why that was unacceptable in September of 1982's LGBTQ unfriendly environment, you know. These days, your boy wants to wear a dress to kindergarten. It's not that big of a deal. 1982, it could have got the parents put in jail. So they very harshly said, no, you can't wear this. You can't go out dressed like that. And I hate it when people tell me I can't fucking do something. I hate it. And that is when, like, stealing my parents' clothing, or my mom's clothing specifically most of the time, at least my dad had his panties stashed too, I found out eventually. 
but stealing my mom's clothes became one of my expressions of who I wanted to be. And every once in a while, yes, I admit, I would come into a pair of her panties and then put it in the back of the drawer and pretend nothing had ever happened. And in retrospect, that wasn't very nice. That was really kind of creepy after all, and I shouldn't have done that. But I didn't know better. And like, I was really trying to avoid shame because I thought I was the only cross-dresser in the entirety of the world and I had to hide my secret because otherwise some horrible fate would befall me. I, and uh, I haven't written the rest of that routine yet, so, you know, I, I don't really even want to talk about my teenage years, but let me tell you this. The other day somebody posted a picture of a 1991 Sears holiday catalog on Facebook and I was damn near triggered. <laughs> Damn, I remembered each and every one of those women and what I let them do to me in my fantasies and sometimes even vice versa because tops are at a premium. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta do your part for the sexual ecosystem even as a horny 12 year old. <laughs> Well, I think I'm ready to start the show proper. Um, we, we have an intro theme song today. Uh, as, as some of you who have seen the show before know, uh, some of the video segments are new, some of them are repeated because they take me a long time to make. So if you have seen this particular opening before, my apologies. Uh, this is an homage to the Portland wrestling uh, broadcasts of the 1970s and 80s, and hopefully it is entertaining to you. This is KPTV, Channel 12, Portland. From Slice Pizzeria and Bar, this is Temple the Bard's live talk show. Brought to you in part by Tom Peterson's 82nd and Southeast Foster Road, Oregon Clark, the TV stereo and appliance store. Hello once again, Frank Bonima here, glad to have you with us, and we're going to have a lot of action for you tonight, the interviews, so forth, going on. First, I want to uh, tell you something that I really hate to do, but it happened. And thankfully, Multnomah County has an incredibly short statute of limitations. Well, I've got to say that at the end of the show, I'm going to have a lot of dirty rats and stool pigeons to dispose of. And I'm very grateful to our sponsor, Tom Peterson, who's going to be giving me some help with that. It happened. I was looking forward to uh, doing a lot of kidnapping. If he hadn't been right, but it turns out that he was, but it was off the air. We'll be back in a moment. That's all the covering up for Temple the Bard. I'm going to do, I'll tell you that. Here's Tom Peterson to tell you about some great buys out that way. I want to take you out on the showroom floor and show you why people drive the extra mile to buy at Tom Peterson. Refrigerators at Tom Peterson's, we've got them. Over 40 on display. Each one with a body in it. Brand names that you're familiar with. Prices, everyday low price, $299. Washers and dryers at Tom Peterson's, we've got them. Each one full of body parts. Five top brands for you to choose from. Itinerant drifters. That Tom Peterson's, we've got them. Over 50 on display. How are you today? I'm really struggling, boss. What's your name? Lonnie Sawzall. Lonnie, I think you just packed body parts into... A refrigerator, a Westinghouse, didn't you? That's right. Good, we're going to deliver tonight, and now you're looking at a range. Well, that's fine. We'd love to deliver both of them this evening. You might ask, well, how can Tom Peterson sell you a refrigerator full of body parts for $399 and then give you an a big pile of hair clippings free well I'll tell you why human hair that's less than 10 inches long ain't worth shit the cancer charities won't even take it and we want to put 1,000 unfortunate victims of non-mob related accidents into Portland refrigerators in the next 20 days the other reason you all-star wrestling bastards are getting too big for your britches. Kinski and Kovacs were fine, but Al Tomko's gonna sleep with the fishes. And as for Stampede, you heart sons of bitches, had better get out of the wrestling business. If you know what's good for you, you should get into non-profit work. Maybe form a foundation or something. Now that's at Tom Peterson's, with two great stores to serve you, both at Southeast 82nd and Foster Road. Can you tell that was from the wrestling themed episode? <laughs> you are getting a glimpse into Triple and I's mind of what we find funny at 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> it's true. This is it. 
So this year, uh, we are in the second season. This is uh, episode 12. We're in the second season of the show. We are going to have a special guest joining us each episode from beyond the grave, thanks to the magic of post-mortem streaming. And that is, of course, Ernie Anderson, the longtime voice of ABC and father of famous director Paul Thomas Anderson. He comes to us from beyond the grave, and we talk to him about the afterlife and television and lots of fun stuff. So, Ernie, uh, everybody's here watching us. What are they missing on television today that they could be seeing if they weren't here with us? Tonight, the saga of an American family continues. A special encore presentation of the most highly acclaimed show of all time. <laughs> no, I'm not going to watch that, Ernie. I don't think so. Well, what else are we missing? Ozzy thinks he's having a quiet evening at home, but Rick's having a party tonight, Tony. No. No. If we did promos like that, they'd still be on the air. Well, you're probably right, Ernie. The, the lack of good promos is most certainly what cost them. What else is on? Sunday. It's the Osmond family rocking and reading under the big top with special guest stars LeVar Burton and Joyce DeWitt. Oh my god, that's horrifying. Is that what Joyce DeWitt is going to look like in the afterlife? Ernie, this sounds like a profoundly depressing existence. Every night, Ernie Anderson up there. Nobody seemed to care. Oh, Ernie, we care. That's why we had you on the show, Ernie. Well, what, what is it that will make you happy? Tell me what it is that will make you happy. Bumper stickers. <laughs> you like bumper stickers? Well, let me tell you what. Temple the Bard's new set of bumper stickers are absolutely out now. Available if you ask me after the show. Uh, sometimes I give them away, but I prefer to sell them because I like money. One's Manic Pixie Dream Cryptid, and the other one is Temple the Bard's Monster Burritos. And I can just head to like my local crematorium and have a couple of them burnt and sent up to you. What do you think about that, Ernie? Mm, you wow. Mm. Yep, yep. Hoochie, hoochie. Rock. Thank you. All right, Ernie, right on. Bumper stickers are going to make Ernie's day. All right, everybody give a big hand to Ernie Anderson. All right, uh, all right, we're going to watch one more video, and then we're going to have uh, our special... Actually, no, we have a different segment. We're not going to watch this video this time. We're not going to watch this video. We're not. Absolutely we're not. Because we have an interesting opportunity to have a special guest star up on the show with us today. Uh, to tell us about uh, uh, some really good news in regards to uh, comedy and personal uh, improvement and validation. Everybody, uh, welcome up to the stage, uh, famed comedy archaeologist Angie Bloomfield. Thank you. Hello. Awesome. Right on. Have a seat. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. So tell, tell me some of the things that have been happening with you in comedy lately. <clears throat> Comedy. Uh, well, you know, I just went to the comedy festival down in Eureka. Right on. Yeah. Um, mostly, though, like, it's not really comedy related, but it's gourd season. So I have squashes at my house right now the size of my leg. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was going to bring one for you, and I forgot. I'm sorry. Back in the 90s, there was this porn site called House of Gourd, where this guy would tie up bondage models into furniture. I love that. Yeah. He couldn't grow them out of the ground, though, so I think you've one-upped him there. Well, what I like to usually do is a, a ding-dong ditch situation where you leave a giant phallic-looking gourd on people's doorsteps. And I shouldn't have said it on the mic because now everyone's going to know it was me. But Angie, if, every year. if you leave a phallic-shaped gourd <laughs> on my doorstep, some dyke in my life is going to be a very happy woman. Maybe I'll leave you, too. Aww. Everyone has, they have a mission now. Everyone needs to go buy a phallic shaped gourd and leave it on the doorstep to throw the pigs off the scent. <laughs> yes. I mean, I honestly have so many, you don't need to buy any guys. I'll just bring them. We, we, don't, them we don't want you getting into trouble. We've got you covered. Okay. So uh, the reason we brought you on the show today is uh, you uh, contacted us and you wanted to tell us something uh, about about like comedy and validation and like something ancient. Like what what is it you want to tell us today? Well, <clears throat> I'm kind of new. I just found out about this. I was just going through some old papers and uh, some old uh, canceled comedians and just like looking through all of their things. And there's something called a quamper that I didn't know about, and I just thought I would tell a, you. A quamper? Is that, is that like some special kind of tagline? Is that a type of joke? What's a quamper? <clears throat> a quamper, it's basically, uh, it's something that you can only make happen around here anyway by okay. traveling uh, 
around um, you know the Portland area and um, fucking other places. I can't. Where are they? I don't know. Four different Salem, Portland, Corvallis, and and Albany. And there's four different uh, open mics. And if you can hit each one of those. Um, you get the val special validation that uh, you always craved that your parents never gave you. And That's yeah. the whole reason not only I, but everybody, as far as I know, got into comedy. Right, yeah. So you're, you're saying that if a comedian completes the quamper doing four open mics in one night, they will unlock some sort of validation that they have never before known as a comic. This is what I've come to understand. Wow, this is amazing. I'm gonna have to do some more research into this. Do you know anyone else we could talk to about it? Um, I'm not sure. I feel like Luke Miller, I've heard him talking about it a little bit, so I'm not sure if he's, I don't know if he's here tonight, but he definitely knows a little bit about it. Um, I know there's some Burger King origination story. Uh, oh, I but, can't with that, it gives me gas. Yeah, so we'll stay away from that. But, uh, but yeah, Luke Miller, I think, knows a little bit. All right, that. this makes sense. Well, we're gonna have to talk to him, and uh, I do believe he might be on, wait a minute, you're, wait a minute, who's on the next episode of the show? I don't remember, I have a terrible producer, they should be fired. All right, well, thank you for telling us about the Quamper. Everybody give it up for Angie Bloomfield today. Thank you. Awesome. I am very much looking forward to this. I need the validation. I need it for my parents. Um, it's almost Christmas and I'm broke. So I want to make up with my parents and get validated so they can send me money. I like that. That's, That's the whole point. The quest for more money. The quest for more money. And cut. Did you know that you all were just part of a movie scene that we just filmed there? That The Quamper is sort of like a made-up thing. We're going to make a cheesy little film, and we needed a premise for the film, so we just decided to film the premise as part of the talk show. You were all part you of were, a happening. You were part of a happening. Diana and I, and we, we make, we, occasionally we make no-budget movies, and this is going to be one of them, about our quest to do four open mics in one day uh, next week, along with Luke Miller and probably Dylan Cianci. Uh, we need to get some fake blood, if any of you uh, know where we can get fake blood. Uh, some nerve paralytic agents for some realistic facial expressions, especially in my case, I can't afford Botox. This one knows. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. You know. yeah, we've got an actual yeah, nurse yeah. in the crowd, so. Can you get us ketamine as well? No Shit. Really? Yeah. That, now, that's, that's, the type, that's the type of uh, party I, I want to take I'm my micropenis into the mashed potatoes. Very much looking <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to the Quamper. Am I actually look, looking forward to like, you know, kind of like the car? We're going to do some filming in the car. Okay, it's going to be uh, Which We're won't be the first time someone's yelled action to me in a vehicle, so. <laughs> so are y'all ready for our uh, main and special guest tonight to be on the show? Come on, big round of applause tonight. Come on, come on. So our, our, our special uh, interview and featured comic guest tonight is uh, uh, basically a legend in the Eugene comedy scene. He came to Eugene roughly 15 years ago, did an incredible amount of work to build up the scene as we know it. And last year he was voted Eugene's funniest comic in the Eugene Weekly's Best of Eugene poll. Everybody give it up for our friend and host of the Monday Slice Mic, Seth Milstein. Thank you. All right. All right. Awesome. Thank you for joining me today. <laughs> it's funny that you thought Luke Miller would be here when he's not doing a set. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, she wasn't supposed to say Luke Miller, but that was an improv. And now we're going to have to change the shooting script because of that. I wasn't going to oh, introduce no. him until later. All right. But now we shot the scene. Now we've got to get an earlier interstitial in with him. These are the risks that one takes shooting an improv movie. You have to mess with these things on the fly. I know. I know. Give it up for uh, Temple's 4077 shirt. Uh, I... I personally was the uh, I personally was the uh, the veteran of having a dad who liked that show too much. That's uh, <laughs> horrible. That show's gotten me through some hard times. No, it's a great show. Although uh, I did get called clinger quite a bit uh, early in my <laughs> trans life, unfortunately. I was a radar guy uh, personally, but uh, you, you probably wore the cap. You know? I just had a, I had a, a fucked up hand that I had to hide with a clip clipboard all the time. So. Oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. So, um, basically, I mean, uh, you were supposed to be on the show back in April, and we yeah. had thunderstorms, and then another show uh, didn't happen. I'm glad you're finally here, and rather Me than too. squeeze a comedy set in, I figured I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about your history with comedy. A lot of us, we come to the scene for various reasons, we learn about comedy as we go along, but it, it seems in a lot of respects that, like, you found comedy at an incredibly early age. Like, tell us about your childhood relationship with comedy. Yeah, it's <laughs> the origin story of someone deciding to do comedy is usually the least funny thing in the world. Uh, 
I have, uh, I have, I had parents that uh, fought all the time. They hated each other for a large portion of my childhood. And uh, I remember one night we came home, we were, uh, we were visiting my aunt's house and uh, she lived two hours away and we left and my parents literally screamed at each other the entire way home. And, uh, and like me and my brothers were just sitting in the back like, like, no phone there was no, there was no uh nothing to distract us we just had to listen to uh them scream at each other and then we walked into the house and they were still like muttering at each other and it was horrible and then i turned the tv on and saturday night live was on and everyone just sat down and shut the fuck up and it was like it never happened and they were just yeah. laughing at us and hell and i was like this is powerful like and so the, from that point on anytime that they, they would start fighting i would just try to be a ham and try to like get them to laugh because that was the only way to make peace in my household and then uh and then and and snl at that point became like a thing like i i was five years old when that happened and i would like beg my parents to stay up and watch snl and they always would and then, uh, and then there was a show for a while that came on after SNL that was called Comic Strip Live. Oh yeah, I remember that. And uh, with host John Mulroney, who is now a cop and a trumper. Uh, <laughs> but he was the greatest back then. Like, I just thought he was the greatest. And, uh, and that, I was like, oh, they don't need wigs. They don't need other people. They don't need scripts. They just walk up to a microphone and say whatever the fuck they want. And that was like, I was like, next level comedy. And, and from that moment, I wanted to be a stand-up. Wow. So you, you took this on as a way, uh, you were providing like emotional labor as a child that you as a child should never have been expected to have had to provide. That's heavy, man. Yeah, I mean, uh, but it is like, uh, until you grow up, you don't realize that anyone has had a different childhood than you. <laughs> it's like... I just thought that everybody's parents screamed at each other, you know, like uh, everyone's dad smoked camel non filters and grumbled while they were watching the news or mash. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I, uh, and my dad was in, in Korea in, when he was in the army. And so that's why he loved mash so much. And then I found out after he died, he was not there during wartime. He just, <laughs> he was like in the post occupation of Korea. And, uh, yeah, he just basically did push-ups and jumped out of planes for fun. Yeah. Those late 50s, you're drafted, but yet, like, you're deployed to peacetime. Yeah, right. so many yeah. stories. So so much uh, imaginary valor. Oh, he wasn't so drafted. Much. He got uh, he got caught stealing a car, and they were like, uh, you can either sign a three-year contract to be in the army, or you can go to jail for five years. Yeah. He was like, I'll take the army, that's cool. That's how Hunter S. Thompson entered the army yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people back in the days, yeah. So, so you had comic strip live and Saturday Night Live, and you used humor to bring peace to your household, and then boom, the age of videotapes comes in. How did that affect you and your family? Oh, uh, videotapes. I remember my dad bringing home the first VCR, and uh, he had like he had like bought a VCR and then ten movies from like a place that was going out of business. We were really poor, so uh, it had to be a deal, and uh, and and like the movie that he got for me was The Wizard of Oz, which I was like already kind of too old for, you know. Um, but then, like, he had all these, like, he had bought all these, like, uh, diff different movies, like comedies and, and war movies and all this shit. And I got really into it. And then once we got a video card, I, like, I would go every day and I would rent three movies. And then, like, to the point where my mom was like, we can't afford to <laughs> rent all the movies that you want to watch. But, yeah, I, so, and I would just go through the comedy section and like, I, at one point I was picking uh, movies by director. I would watch any stand-up. Like that was always my first choice. I would get a, a stand-up and then I would, and it was like Gallagher. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, that uh, was a stand-up I was exposed um, to. D Dwarf, do you remember Dwarf? Oh, yeah. golf and all that shit. Yeah, yeah. Tim Conway. A, it was a, a Tim Conway. Tim Conway was Ernie Anderson's comedy partner. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
and uh, and then um, but uh, yeah, I was I was like I would like watch Woody Allen movies, and then like eventually like uh, when I hit puberty, I just started renting like any body comedy. Like I've seen Porky's probably six hundred times. Uh, <laughs> I jerked off 599 times to it and sent to watch it with my parents once. Um, very uncomfortable. Uh, but no, I was, uh, you know, I was frantic. And, you know, the good shit was, uh, was always uh, Richard Pryor and, oh, yeah. and uh, uh, George Carlin. Yeah, so there was, and Gilda Live. Uh, Gilda, Gilda Live, Live was, was like, it still is one of my favorite specials, that and uh, Richard Pryor Live in concert. Gilda was one of the all-time greats, and she was basically the um, the next generation of one of my favorites, Gracie Allen. Yeah. Oh, Very yeah. I, I, Allen. I caught up on that, all that stuff when Nick at Night started. Yeah. <laughs> I did watch uh, uh, um, Gracie Allen and uh, George Burns and everything. And I, I just love, I still, to this day, I love comedy. I will watch most comedies. <laughs> So, so you, you, this has just been like a lifelong passion. When did you think that you could get up on stage and start doing it? Um, when I was in my 20s, I had a friend that would go, I, I was living in Indiana at the time, and I had a friend that would go to Indianapolis uh, once a week just to do the, uh, the open mic at like, I think it was Chuckles, it was the name of the club. And, um, and he was like, yeah, you should go with me because I always talked about it. And then... Uh, he was so bad at comedy, and it was also just kind of a piece of shit as a person, that I just didn't want to show up with him, you know? Like, I, I didn't want to be the guy that Dan Stoffer brought to the, the thing. So uh, I, ha I found an old notebook, and I wrote, I had written, like, you know, 10 minutes worth of material, and it was like, I, I was looking through it, and it was like me making fun of George W. Bush and John Kerry because that was what was happening at the time, and uh, and I wanted to play both sides of the field. So uh, yeah, and uh, it, it was awful. I think I could probably make some of that stuff work now. <laughs> the cocky shit that we tell each other. So that was in uh, Indiana. Was that was in Indiana. Indiana, and then so I never did go. Uh, but I was a uh, I had a. Uh, I lived with a band for a while, and we I was like on the road with them. Uh, I was the road manager, which was Glorified Roadie. What were they called? Uh, they were called Somebody, one of the oh. worst names for a band. <laughs> yeah, ever. that's really memorable. Ever. Yeah, and uh, um, so yeah, I would, every once in a while for like uh, bigger shows, they would be like, you should go out and bring us up and like introduce us. And I, I, uh, I've always had like a uh, crippling stage fright. And so I, I would always say no, but then like every once in a while they would actually talk me into doing it. And then it was fun. And I would, I would like riff and like, I'd give them all weird nicknames and shit. And like, that was the closest I came until I was, uh, I was like 31 when I actually did an open mic. And, and was that here? Or? No, that was in Portland. Portland. Yeah, okay. I mean, it was when I lived here. But uh, yeah, I did an open mic. I went to the Bridgetown Comedy Festival and I got like super inspired and I was like, I have to try it. I told my then wife, I was like, I gotta try it just so I know. <laughs> and she was like, well, how do you know? And I was like, if I get one laugh, I should do it again. And then I went up there and I did a three minute set and I got like one person chuckled at the setup for one of the jokes. And I was like, I probably shouldn't do this. <laughs> and then I didn't do it for a year, but then like Bridgetown happened again and I got really into it again. And I was talking about it a lot, I guess. I didn't even realize I was I was lamenting it. And then uh, my, uh, my then wife's uh, mom was like, look, I read this, they're doing this thing at Cosmic Pizza, which is now World Pies. Uh, where I produce a show with Rudy, and uh, I went, it was a, they were doing a comedy show, a booked comedy show, and then an open mic afterwards. And I did that show, I did that open mic, and uh, I, I got, I did the same exact set I did a year ago before, and I got laughs on every punchline. And like, and then I was like, 
I had gone through all my material and I hadn't got the light yet, so I just started riffing. That was not so great, but uh, <laughs> but I did. I was like, it was so validating. And I remember like walking off the stage, like at that point they didn't even have a real stage. It was just like, uh, it was like drum risers that <laughs> made up the stage. And I remember walking down like the squeaky aluminum steps and I was just like, I'm just gonna do this forever. Like, I don't care, I'm, it's definitely too late for me to have any like real success doing it. You know, like people that get successful start when they're like 20 or whatever. But I was like, this will always be something I do as a hobby for sure. That well, makes sense. Yeah. And so, um, out of all the comics here in Eugene that have been doing stand up, I mean, you've, how long have you been doing stand up in Eugene proper? Uh, I'd say it's uh, it's been like 13 years. Probably. So, I mean, there's basically Leanne and you are the two veterans. Yeah, there, the there was a. Uh, still performing. There was, yeah, there was a guy, uh, Chris Castles, who was like, uh, he was like a little bit younger than me, and he did. He would put on a show like once every three months or something like that. And they were like shit shows. Uh, and who would do it? Uh, if anybody remembers uh, Black Forest. Oh, yeah. Black <laughs> Forest was. I've heard of it. Was, it really, uh, gar it, it had a smell. <laughs> like, Black Forest had a smell when you walked in that was like, it was so unique. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it was a very small room. It, I mean, it was it was real tiny, and it sucked. And he would do shows there, and he would just get drunk and let anybody that wanted to go up on stage. So, so like, I felt so cool getting booked on my first one, and then I was just like, oh, like three dudes that were just in the audience, like got to go up. I was like, this is less special now, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he was great because he, t he taught me everything that you shouldn't do as a producer <laughs> and as a comic. Uh, and uh, and it was uh, it was an education. It was, I, like I do thank him for that because uh, I didn't know shit about anything. I got to watch him like welch on guarantees, and then I was like, <laughs> note to self: don't if you say an amount of money, you have to pay that person the amount of money that you say. Yes, just just good producer ethics if yeah. you want to produce a second or third show. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and then. Uh, uh, I, I did a I did a couple of, he he had me host a show that he was running. And so he would produce a show, I would host it, he would always feature, and then he would bring headliners down from Portland. And so I kinda got this like weird little education and it was really most of it was what not to do. And then uh, and then I started hunting for my own room. And uh, I, I found the Oak Street Speakeasy, which is every place that I started doing comedy in this town has been closed. Uh, that's how bad my comedy is. Um, hey, you know how to close a room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I found this place called the Oak Street Speakeasy, and it was like an underground bar, and it was it was like a really cool space, and I just knew that it would be good for comedy. And I ran a showcase there for about two and a half years, and at the same time somebody handed over uh, a showcase at Diablo's Downtown Lounge, uh, which I believe now is a Thai restaurant next to the defunct bus station. And uh, so I was running both of those rooms at the same time. And so like I, I hit the ground running as a producer. And you've been going ever since? Yeah, ever since. Yeah. And now we have a comedy scene where, uh, you know, there are mics uh, five nights a week. Mm -hmm. uh, there are at least five, sometimes as many as a dozen comedy shows in town to go to over yeah. the course of a month. How do you feel the Eugene comedy scene is now compared to some of its other periods in its past? Uh, it's, it's uh, I think the, the best period, and I think we're kind of getting back to it, the best period was right after the pandemic because when we started being able to do it again, we started here and uh, it was like, no one took it for granted anymore. It wasn't anybody's hobby. Everybody was like, we're fucking doing this. And people would stay and support each other's sets. And that lasted for about six months. <laughs> it was a good time. That, that's when I got here. Yeah, yeah, that's when you showed up. Yeah. That's like, like, I remember one of the earliest mics at, uh, at Lucky's and, yeah. and seeing you perform for the first time. And I was like, oh, great. We got a good, good guitar comic up here. Oh, yeah. And totally. then, uh, <laughs> but then, like, I saw your stuff and I was like, this is actually really inspired. And, yeah. and like, I just, I don't know. I think there was, like, for a while, there was a, there was like a hierarchy of comedy, like where they were, the, like the old heads were like, 
we're, we don't have to talk to the newbies. Uh, and then it, it, it just became like, hey, we're, we all fucking love this thing. And we, we got into it for different reasons. But kind of the same reasons, yeah, you know. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so it's beautiful. And then, like, I feel like we, you know, everyone that's in the comedy scene knows we hit a patch of uh, drama not too long ago. But I feel like we got over it. Yeah. And uh, and I, that's the thing is, I think we're we just have more grown ups in the scene. So. There are a lot of people looking to uh, foster something mutually as opposed yeah. to step on each other's necks to get some perceived benefit that isn't exactly. really there. Exactly. This is too yeah. small of a scene to be cut through. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. People that felt like that was the way to be in comedy uh, either quit or fucking move to bigger markets. Yeah, um, they, they can go cutthroats where the blood runs a little bit, yeah. you know, a little bit thinner as far as I'm concerned. Well, I, I, I really uh, like I really appreciate you uh, telling us about like your history in comedy and a little bit about the evolution of the Eugene scene here. Yeah. Uh, before you do your set, I want to mention um, sometimes comedians, you know, we we just we help people uh, get away from you know the pains and troubles of the day. Sometimes uh, you know comedians are some of our best social commentators, and uh, obviously Carlin falls into that. Yeah. Uh, Pryor falls into that. I feel that in regards to mental health, uh, uh, Hannah Gadsby and Maria Bamford are doing some amazing work uh, yeah. bringing and, awareness and to mental Gary health Goldman, issues. Gary Goldman did an entire special on depression that like really fucking uh, helped me out in a really rough time. So I'll have to check that out. I don't yeah. think I've seen that. It's on HBO. And then here we have in the Ukraine, literally a man who is, uh, he learns Ukrainian from you know, rather than his native Russian, similar languages. He stars in a show called Servant of the People, where he's a, a layman elected president, and then he ping pongs from there to be the actual president, and now he's a wartime president in what might be uh, the beginnings of World War Three. I know I'm laughing to keep the pain away. Um, <laughs> we are all gonna die. <laughs> can, can you imagine yourself being at the same time? Yeah, Not maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. But I admire the shit out of that guy, and I feel no, yeah, he's so awesome. sorry for him to be in that role. But yet, the day when he's like, no, nah, don't evacuate me in a helicopter, but like, bring us weapons. I was like, oh my yeah. god, this guy's badass. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, so badass. yeah, I mean, and like, uh, you know, that people have those uh, joke bumper stickers for like uh, Stuart Colbert. Uh, I think in 2016 that was like a really popular thing and I was like I'm fucking on board for that ticket because the the person that should be president is the person that doesn't want to be Yeah, the person with the greatest uh, empathy and capacity to build teams, listen to those teams. Yeah, nobody nobody wants that job from that particular demographic and it's darn unfortunate. Well, yeah, that's a way, a way depressing way to begin your comedy set. <laughs> well, I'm doing a comedy set. I just remembered that that was yeah, totally. The show. It's a thing. It doesn't have to be a real long one. Just long enough for me to refresh my drink and take a piss. Okay. <laughs> All right. Give me a beer while you're in there. I'll get you another beer. Time. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, no. You get a free. It's free. All right. All right. Sounds All right. good. All right. Everybody, give it up for tonight's featured comedian, Seth Milstein. Oh, hello. Hey. <laughs> Hey, you're the only people I don't know in here, so I'm just gonna. This is basically a set just for you two. <laughs> uh, I um, I did have a. I got COVID recently um, uh, last night. Uh, listen, it's a dry, persistent cough. Nothing this low grade fever can knock out. Uh, no, I uh, I had COVID uh, like a month and a half ago, two months ago, something like that, and. Uh, and I didn't get it before that. Like, so it took me, like, I got to the point where I was just like, I think I'm invincible, guys. <laughs> like, the government needs my blood. I, we can end this right now if I just give the government two vials of my blood, because uh, I have a super serum in me. And then I got it, and I was like, nah, I'm just a piece of shit like everybody else. That's cool. Um, do you guys live in the Whitaker? in the Whitaker neighborhood, this neighborhood that we're in right now? Oh, you're travelers, okay. You don't live anywhere right now, all right, yeah. I live in a really shitty neighborhood downtown. It's uh, it's horrible, and I have a, I have a, a security camera in my room because there's a lot of break-ins in my neighborhood, and it's like a motion-activated security camera that I turn on and turn off like when I leave and uh, come home. And uh, the other night, I forgot to turn it off because I was drunk. And then uh, I woke up in the morning and there was like 
free notifications on my phone that were videos of me jerking off. Um, let me let me tell you, it was the worst angle. If you could think of the worst angle, it was that one. It was from the bottom. <laughs> it was at the foot of the bed. It was and so I realize what happened. Like I see the thing and I'm like, <gasps> like that's that's been out there for, for five hours. That's been in the cloud somewhere. Like somebody at somebody at Ring headquarters knows what my balls look like. That's fucked up. And uh, I went to I went to erase it and I accidentally tapped the video instead of the X button and uh, and it started playing and I was like instantly horrified and then I was just like two seconds in I was like all right what's going on here and I was watching it the way football players watch game tape like I was like all right okay so that's what it looks like when I do that I should probably switch to overhand right there that would be good. Um, I've done that joke a few times, and it's a lie. The true story of what happened is that I came home with another person, and then we did a bunch of stuff. And then I, I realized the next morning that I had accidentally recorded it, and I got very excited to watch it because I was like, cool. And then uh, three seconds into the tape, I took my shirt off and I was like, no, thank you. I, I need to send a card, I think. I need to send a, a condolence card or an apology to this poor woman. It's, uh, it's, it was disturbing. Uh, I, um, I'm at, uh, i trying to remember what the, okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm at, I'm at the point in my life where I, I realized recently that uh, I make every decision in my life based on hoping that my fifth grade bully will think I'm cool. There's no reason, to, I'm not even Facebook friends with him. To be honest, in fifth grade, he had a denim jacket and a spiked mullet. He's definitely in jail right now. <laughs> There's no way he's not in jail right now. But like, I still operate under like middle school mentality. Like I'm like, what can I do that will look cool and make people think I'm cool? And also huge, huge motivation for me is just not getting yelled at. Like that, that seems like, like I should not be afraid of getting yelled at because I'm a grown up. I can yell back if I want to, but I was like, <laughs> I was in Jen's car on the way to Savage Henry, and I was just, I was like about to light a cigarette, and then I was like, wait, she's gonna yell at me. And I was like, hey, is it okay if I smoke? And she was like, no. And I was like, I almost got yelled at. And then for like two hours, I was just imagining what it would be like to have Jen J be mad at me. And it was not a good. It was not a good fantasy at all. Uh, my son is uh, 15. He was a he, he's a sophomore in high school, and uh, last year I asked him because I was like I was like oh he's a freshman he's probably having a rough time you know and I said uh, I said are, are you uh, people picking on you because you're a freshman and he goes no we don't really have bullies anymore <laughs> and I was like have you ever been mad at like the one thing that your generation got right <laughs> like. I was like, I, I'm so glad that he doesn't have to experience that, but at the same time, someone's got to kick him in his dick, you know? Like, <laughs> at some point, this kid needs to be taken down a peg. And he's like a nice kid, he's not even cocky or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and then I was just thinking about it, and I was like, how fucking good were all of our bullies? In my generation's bullies were so fucking good an entire generation of people were just like, our kids are never going to give anyone a smallie. That is never going to happen. That'll be the one thing. We, have, we live in Eugene. People let their kids smoke pot in their rooms like at 13 or whatever, but they're just like, you better not fucking say an unkind word to anybody. And uh, I just want to give props to all of my bullies, personally. Uh, like, Let's give it up for John DeCipio. 
Joey Randazzo, the Ferrar brothers, Janine Fraley, who was a fucking monster and beat me up because I didn't like the show Reba. And I, just, I didn't understand what they were doing at the time, but I get it now. I'm on board. I'm on board. Anyway, that's, that's all the comedy I'm going to do. Right. Keep it going for that. Now, I have an interesting opportunity for us if you're interested in sticking around. Uh, it's a segment called Temple, Diana, and Seth Riff over 1985 New York local commercials. I am fucking psyched. All right, this is going to be fun. I Let's welcome back up stage Diana on Ramsey. Every one of these commercials. <laughs> All right, where? Yeah, just be, just behind Seth over there. And so, um, basically, you can see it on this monitor, or you can look at the big monitor, whatever you want. Um, and so th these are just uh, some commercials we found on YouTube that are representative of New York's local programming circa 1985. And uh, here we go. Yul Brenner returns in Port of New York following these messages. Get a video camera for Christmas. This is my TV boy right here. Crazy Eddie? Get it all on sale now during Crazy Eddie's greatest Christmas sale ever. Is that Eddie Pepitone? No. I know the entire history of the entire... Crazy Eddie franchise. This guy <laughs> definitely has a right. hooker in his Tell strength. us the history of the Crazy okay. Eddie franchise right now. I want to hear this. That guy is not Crazy Eddie. That guy was a, uh, a DJ in uh, South Carolina. And uh, his name is Jerry Connell. Okay. And uh, he, was a, he was a radio DJ. And uh, the, when they first started doing radio spots, he just did a really, really good read. And uh, you'll see at the end of the commercial, his his signature was that he would uh, he would say, "Come down to Crazy Eddie. The prices are insane." And he was like, the, "And that's why they hired him. They were like, you're, you're the guy. You got to fucking do this.'" Um, the real Eddie, I think his name was Eddie Adler, uh, it started the store with his dad, and then um, it turned out. They they had, at the at the peak they had forty three stores across New York and New Jersey, and it turned out that for every five dollars he reported to the IRS, one dollar went in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so at one point he, they were the IRS was breathing down his neck, and he he just cashed out all of his stocks for millions and millions of dollars, and then they started an investigation and he split and went to Israel. <laughs> and stayed in Israel for three years. But listen, if you are going to embezzle from the American government and try to escape to another country, don't escape, escape to a country that owes a huge debt to America. <laughs> because the moment that they were like, hey, we have some charges, Israel was like, all right, here you go. And, uh, and then he came back and he had really good lawyers because he was a millionaire and, uh, and they, they, tried to, they tried to prosecute him several times and he never got prosecuted and then finally they fucking put him away for eight years. He served three and then he got out and then died in 2016. God damn. And, uh, and, and he had done such irreparable damage to the books and the, the uh, financial integrity of the company that they fucking went bankrupt almost immediately <laughs> after he left. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So, and uh, I think Jerry Connell's still alive, but unfortunately, his uh, Wikipedia page, there's another comedian that works a lot with Sarah Palin, <laughs> and, she, and he's named Jerry Connell, and that's the Wikipedia page that you go to. But I think the actor is still alive that played Crazy Eddie in the end. Well, this, this is all the plausible. Show. Yeah. And Crazy Eddie, uh, the DJ, Jerry Connell, based the character of Crazy Eddie on another 50s local New York uh, uh, guy who owned a, uh, he owned a used car salesman uh, or used car lot and then switched to electronics. And his name was uh, Earl Madman Munson. <laughs> so and his whole thing was like oh, I'm so crazy these prices are so crazy and so like Jerry Connell lifted that entire uh, bit from Earl Van Damme wow he was so he was basically the Milton Burl of Pitchman yes yeah, yeah yeah for sure well this is all a very plausible and real narrative but as but, we see a handful of crazy eddies uh, as this reel goes on I'm gonna make up a different story <laughs> okay Yul <laughs> Brenner returns in Port of New so York following these messages thank you for that <laughs> Get a 
a video camera for so the Christmas So he's trapped TV in the Eddie Dome. Screen, TV, and and the, the only way he can get out, out is to make lots Christmas and lots of commercials and find his family and freedom. And we mean it. Go to Crazy Eddie now and get a video of his home. And his whole bit is that take advantage of my mental illness. Get a good price on a TV. I'm insane. I'm going to be bankrupt a year after the guy leaves. <laughs> so much to buy, so much to see. You'll find it at Fleaport, find it at Fleaport. I want to go to Fleaport. Get what you need. Fleaport does not exist anymore, but it is a good place for everyone to buy their coins. Like, it is where my mom would buy my shoes <laughs> because they were super cheap. It looks like the type of place where I could just like curl up in a sleeping bag in the back and let them close around me and then wander around at night. Yeah. My, my mom, would, she would be going to Fleetport and I would just be like, I'd be like, can you get me Reebok sneakers? And then she would come back with Reebok sneakers. Oh God, it was the future. This is the Bay Ridge. Oh, I love this. I used to the Bay Ridge. I grew up here. It's fall, become Mitsubishi. All of the world. This guy sells pizza cars. Like I can't say Mitsubishi correctly. Mitsubishi. Too little, too much pepperoni. You start to see it. I meant Mitsubishi or Lincoln. This is the fucking car the guy from the box of pizza that says you've tried all the rest and now try the best. That's all. Oh shit. And he's still in in the crazy dome. He's desperately trying to escape. GLaDOS is like looking down on him, giving him commands. You know, uh, if you've ever watched Futurama, they have a character on there that's a robot called Malfunctioning Eddie. Oh god. <laughs> and that was totally based on Crazy Eddie. Good, Temple. I'm Zai Sproling. President of Hair Club for Men. Have you ever thought about doing something? He's like not just the president, hair. he's also and a This important new booklet. <laughs> oh, he'll tell something you something should have. Yeah. And I'll see that you get it free. And I am the most monotone CEO in the entire five bars. Yeah, I'm Cy Sperling. My lips don't work. Ordinary pleasant techniques. Originally, he had to be talked out of like this. I'm going to switch to the most random system. The covers are good. The not so good points. Of toupees and wigs. It's not a toupee. The suture process. Transplants and a lot more. We it's designed to give you the facts you need to make a thousand choice. So basically, like the Cenobites are providing the air for No, sorry. Absolutely. Just okay. call the toll free number now. You get one pound of hair for every pin on one head's face. Oh, I love it. Showing so before and after photos of real hair cut clients. God, this guy looks so sad. So call now for your free copy. And by the way, how did this guy make some I'm not only the hair club president, but I'm also a client. Oh my God, he looks so good. Oh god, oh, that's because the money store qualified borrowers get Oh yeah, Phil Rizzuto. Famous mortgage. Yankee. What do you New mean York legend. Rich? One of that the worst announcers in baseball history. <laughs> they should be Phil Malaprop as a Random Brenda make your high interest in the Yankees with the money store. Money store and find out how low our rates are today. Like, that commercial existed, and I kept asking my parents, like, why don't we just go to the money store and buy some money? Get money. Get money. And we don't have to be poor anymore. And they didn't want to explain it. It costs that much. Yeah. Easy pickings. Yeah, yeah. Easy pickings. I hope that's not like a sex trafficking store. It's like you come in for a modeling session and before you know it, you're on a boat to Taiwan. Easy Pickens was like the early Marshalls. Oh, okay. It's crazy, Eddie's crazy Easy Christmas sale ever. Get a vacuum cleaner, popcorn maker, toaster on the other side of the street. Hey, they fed Eddie. Eddie. He's got some popcorn now. He's not with that malnutrition. I went to a gay bar in Chicago called the Nut Bush. You know what you're talking about. There's another one called the Manhole. Yeah, of course. Hurry to Hobart. Hobart? Oh, okay, that's another place. I, you know, that's not an appropriate name. It should be called Sex Worker Warehouse, not Hobart. <laughs> It's an eight-hour video recording. Yeah, I love that it's a video recording. Movies for a year, dust cover, and storage rack. Hobart's a flag is the home of the free. It's VCR sale day. Tomorrow at Hobart's Paris, Long Island, and we'll never go away. I'm going to you free. Is that your best price? And then find a new line of work. 
My customers expect the, the lowest boss. prices. The boss. <laughs> At Lumber Headquarters, he buys top quality lumber. You see, if Cy Sperling hadn't he got his pubes embedded in his head, he could have been the boss. The best prices. Look what the boss has on special. Temple, you, you are giving week. me so much nostalgia for my terrible childhood right now. Tragical, let's see. I feel like this dude wants to start rapping over this music. Like, well, we're getting the triple and clean the money. I told him to get around. Get around. Get around. Get around. Get Get a compact disc player, get a stereo rack system, get it all on. Oh, you didn't go crazy. Did you only you know go with the Santa hats? You did an Easter Bunny one. Yeah, I'm all over the world. It was all from the same reel. I didn't have time. Honest. Okay. Okay. QP has just about everything that you could possibly want. This was the AIDS era. I wonder what QP could even be. Tremendous savings at QP's marketplace. Over Wait a minute. Shops indoors. These people are talking shit the about, brands you about what is it, Vanport? QP is at least 40 to 50%. Oh, QP is for free purchases. I like These that people are disrespecting Fleetport with their loyalty to QP. The, the, the hell is this? Why do you shop at Canine Caters? The selection of pet food and healthcare products are incredible. I know I can get the service that I need. I know my dentist likes to chew on dog food. Could you imagine being and the actor? Like, what are we doing today? You're gonna be the guy in the chair while there's other actors in your mouth. Come on, come to Canine Caters. They are the pet food pro shop. Hey, I made my new break as an actor in New York. I'm playing dental patient number one. In a low ad, the pet is Zag Ray. Metropolitan Avenue, Rigo Park, Queens. Bring your home to life with a visit to Petland Discounts. Some of those pet advertisements. Oh God. Of Petland Discounts. Oh God. For 20 years, we've worked with every product to help keep your pet healthy and happy at I discount prices. And the staff always ready. I wonder how they handled questions. it when kinky people this came in looking for supplies for their pony play and such. Like that, you know. to I wonder how they handled that. Petland discounts. Probably get out of here, you freak. Pets. Now 27 convenient locations, all open seven days. You will open seven days. Order the returns in New York following these messages. I love how every one of these commercials, the announcer sounds like Joe Pesci. No net cost for you. When you install new windows, you can increase the rent for each apartment. Increase the rent. And reduce tenant complaints. A small rent increase pays for your this new window. No money down. Rent. 100 financing, no money down. Your monthly payments will not be more than your total rent increase. You Have son of a bitch! Your rent increase you son financing. of a bitch! Hey, this is work dead center in Reagan's America. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is loving it. <laughs> Alright. Is this like Radio City Music Hall or something? I don't know. This is a commercial. They have a much bigger stage. Play this playground. Get a video recorded for Christmas. Get a cover TV. Get it all on sale now. This is the greatest Christmas sale ever. Crazy Eddie. His prices are insane. Poor, poor man. In this youth-oriented world, it makes sense to stay young-looking as long as Yeah, because this guy knows about the fucking youth movement. You can achieve a younger, yeah. more attractive appearance through the miracle of modern times. This guy's hip and with it to the stuff that the kids like, support. for sure. Our board certified kind of looks like Alan all these ball procedures within the comforting environment of Parsons Hospital. Why, why did New Yorkers circa 1985 like, need like hair plus and plastic surgery so bad? Do they happen to live in like a vain entertainment based like megalopolis? When you give to the WOR TV Children's Christmas Fund, you oh, no. the youngsters TV of all station ages. Grift. school children receive gifts of winter clothing and toys. Sure they will, the Tom. Newborns are welcomed with warm clothing and blankets to help them get off to a healthy and warm start. Please give what you can to the WOR TV Children's Christmas Fund, Box 9, Seacock, yeah, New Jersey. New Jersey, it's across state lines. You're fucked. That's not even tax deductible. Are you ready, Queen? Come on, Eddie, you can get out. Oh, now he's living a good life. In the fashion store in town, you'll fall in love with United Status Apparel. Oh, my God. Big savings on famous names. Shoulder pads bigger than your tits. Because we wear heels every day. It looked like she was wearing the curtains. <laughs> <laughs> God, the fucking propaganda. I'm loyal to USA. You're loyal to USA, huh? What do you want for Christmas? 
This is this, this is like a real indication of the time because the red is open to the and it's, it's sometimes you just have to buy a kid a toy to get him to go to sleep. Yeah. You want to shut your kid up? Red is open till midnight. Now you just shove the iPod. I've had it happen. It's too hard. Five hundred push-ups, Mister. I can't even do five hundred push-ups. So come to Major Chevrolet, Steinway Street, off Northern Boulevard, Long Island City. Hiya. What a man. Man. That was back when you ah! see the Negro College Fund represented no! a national asset. Each that is a word that Ronald Reagan should never say. No, absolutely not. I think so he financial started financial that fund just so he could say it. Programs <laughs> in 42 <laughs> colleges and universities. <laughs> The United Negro College Fund helps While we let the entire gay community die of AIDS, we're going to tokenize only the most intelligent and easily exploitable of a minority community. Join your president in this ironic mission. Oh my God. Your contribution what an to awful a man. Such a punchable America's face. tomorrow depends upon the education our young people. I don't know. I don't I don't like you know, you're giving so that Ronald Reagan a lot of shit right, right now. Uh, and and Ronald Reagan is responsible for some of the best punk music that has ever happened in America. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> what do you think his body looked like under Because he has like that weird... If you're a middle sex Oh, yeah. Was no, it was... Uh, he definitely used to bring a bag of mayonnaise, for sure. National origin, handicap... That's the... Uh, that window there was the one that heard clap and sun fell out of. Call the Housing Coalition of Middlesex County at 201 <laughs> Let's, let's, let's get Diane on Skankfest. Somebody He's breaking free of the Christmas dome. I can see Jules penis in me. Skankfest will, but I think this is the last year, right? <laughs> They're just going to be like, well, we really opened the can of worms. One worm in particular. <laughs> I, th I think Crazy Eddie's finally found his family and they're headed to Skatefest. Wow, he finally oh. broke free of the Christmas dome and oh. has found his people. I feel great for Crazy Eddie. Do you feel great for Crazy Eddie? Yeah. Right on. That was pure magical. Give it up for our interview and comedy and riffing guest, Seth Milstein. Thank you for being on the show. Oh, yeah. Today. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's always great. Such yeah, I'll take that, Mike. Such a delight. So we're getting towards the end of our, our show today. Um, it, it's, it's really it was good to have Seth here. Um, we are getting towards the end. We do have a couple of segments left before we're going to send you off into uh, the cold night. Um, we do have to pay the bills. It is important in the show. So there are commercials in the show sometimes. So I want to show you today's commercial from the sponsor of today's show, located just down the street. Would you like to invest up to $10 an hour in your spare time? Well, by becoming a Blair Alley customer, you can do just that. Sound good? There's something for just about everyone. From Blair Alley's classic collection of pinball machines to Eugene's finest sticker art collection. There's a guy with a bass guitar. Diana screaming at Dr. Who. That is bullshit. Fuck you. Fuck you, machine. An old dog. Crotch staplings. Diana screaming at Star Trek. Come Invisible Jenga. Eddie Pearl Plumber's Crack. The secret menu at Wonder Wiener. And Diana screaming at the change machine. Tilt! What do you mean, tilt? You don't have to sit at home alone huffing household cleaning products anymore. So join the wonderful Blair Alley family and see just how easy it is to turn your extra cash into spare time. Blair Alley, where Black Knight is always broken. <laughs> Thank you, Blair Alley. Thank you, Blair Alley. Speaking of which, that's where I'm going to be when all of this is over. One of my favorite places in the world. All right, and how many of you were here for the most previous episode of the talk show with Eric Sparks and Eric Fitzgerald? How many of you were here for that? It doesn't look like anybody. Great, we get to repeat a segment. Hey, 
hey, free comedy for you. Temple and Diana present do's and don'ts of hiring a trans sex worker. Yeah, out of left field, isn't it? Same, same way. Yeah, the same, same yeah, way. Same, same way. way. We, 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 we rehearsed this. We rehearsed this shit. Perfect. All right, we're going to give you some hints and tips in case you ever want to hire a trans sex worker about how to do it the right way. Do. Choose what you want to do from the sex worker's list of acts and prices. Don't. Choose what you want to do from your own list of personal neuroses and sexual hangups. See, that's a really good piece of advice. Do. Pay the sex worker's regular prices, and if you must negotiate price, do so in good faith. Don't. Ask, hey, can I get a discount on blowjobs with my Safeway Club card? <laughs> do. Shower in advance of your booking or pickup and practice good hygiene. Don't. Take a bird bath with a squeegee in a gas station parking lot and call it good. <laughs> do. Prepare in advance by learning transgender cultural competency and best practices. Don't. Prepare in advance by printing out dozens of pictures of Laverne Cox's face and coming on them. <laughs> do. Ask the sex worker if they have a preference of location for the upcoming transaction. Don't. It, Shit, sorry. Ah! Sorry. Don't insist on picking them up in your white panel van and taking them behind the loading dock at Fred Meyer. Mm -hmm. This is known as the Tyler Jones maneuver. <laughs> I feel like, oh, never mind. Okay. Do. If the sex worker you hired has a penis, open your mouth wide so you don't scrape it when you're giving head. Don't. Eat it like an artichoke and scream, come on, baby, make me some mayonnaise. <laughs> Do. Stay safe by using a condom and water based lube. Don't. Empty the spare change from your pockets and ask, is this enough for bareback? Mm -hmm. Do Be respectful with your communications Don't Say chicky 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 I want dicky 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 <laughs> Don't do that Do When an out and proud sex worker wins the POW Pro Wrestling Championship Get your picture taken with them yeah. Alright that's the end of the fucking show Go home motherfuckers <laughs> That is. Let's see. We had no way to end this. So that's just it. Yeah. That's just what we do. Woo! Professionals. Want to give a shout out to uh, our guests, Seth Milstein and Angie Bloomfield. Uh, if you want to come back for more comedy on Friday, there's LGBTQ Comedy Night here Friday. The canopies are up. It's going to rain, but it's going to be beautiful. And if you want to see the next episode of the talk show, that's going to be Wednesday, November 30th at 9 p.m. at Lucky's downtown where we're going to have pretty much all of the Wednesday comedy producers on the show uh, for some shenanigans and hijinks. Jen Jay is going to be on that show. Devin Jones is going to be on that show. Nathan Hart's going to be on that show. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, be there or be somewhere else entirely. Good night, everybody. And Jen Jay is going to be LGBT. Uh, you're going to be here this Friday as well. Okay. All right. Yeah, Jen's headlining Friday. I'm sorry. I should have said that. Like Everybody in the audience is on the show in the near future that we're doing. <laughs> You're all going to be part of the show. You're all going to be part of the show. That's not special. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Good night for the third time. And if it said M on my driver's license, I'd flash you a titty. But I've got the X, so i got to keep it in my shirt. Woo!